Hey, Crosswinds family. I'm so glad that you could join us this week for our Do Gooder series. We are so thankful that we have the opportunity to learn what the Bible is teaching us about being a person of goodness. I definitely feel like there's a lot of good to be done. And as you saw on the bottom of the screen, my name is Zach and I work with our middle school and preteen students. This year has been interesting to say the least. We've had to change the way we do ministry. Our hope is for students and leaders to connect with each other and God. Thankfully, here at Crosswinds, we have a lot of open space, so we've been able to do socially distant in-person gatherings. We play games, learn together, and have time in our small groups. It has been a great place for students to connect. If you are a middle school or high school student, I want to invite you, or parents, I want to invite your students to join us on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. for middle school and 7 p.m. for high school. If you're not meeting in person yet, we still have virtual meetings for our middle school students on Sunday mornings. Email me to find out how to join or get more information. Now, some of you adults are asking, what about us? We want to connect in person too. Well, we've been offering in-person services for up to 100 people on Sunday mornings. It is an acoustic style worship service outdoors where we wear masks and maintain our distance. While our on-demand services, like the one you're at right now, are still the way most of our community is experiencing church, we have seen the need for people to have an in-person experience. If you are that person, simply go onto our website and reserve your spot for next Sunday. We are excited to see you there. I wanna thank you for continuing to give to our church during this time. Your generosity has made it possible for us to continue doing good things. Maybe you are thinking of how you can start giving to this mission at Crosswinds. We have three ways that you can give. You can text, go onto our website, or you can even mail us a check. I think that's what those things are called. Again, I wanna thank you so much for your continued support. Before we hear today's message with Chris, we have one more thing, so check this out. Super, 
delicate to my touch. Okay, so this one's thicker, in my opinion. And it has less of a scent than option A. Like, it's just softer, it's thicker. Which is better for blowing my snot. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I would say B is Kleenex. Yeah, this one has a better sound to it. Yeah, this is def B is definitely the, the generic brand. I did, look at that, Kleenex. Wow, I am shook. I was totally wrong. Kleenex. Kleenex, step up your game. You can actually see light through it. Discrepancies in the ridges, that kind of thing. Now, neither of these are like 30% less MSG or, you know, these are just good old typical chips. Kind of flakes off. These ones have a scent. These ones don't, which I'm confused about. Where I could only have one chip at a time. Where here, I could kill like half a bag. I might be switching my opinion. So I'm gonna say B is the actual Ruffles. Generic. I was wrong. The Ruffles brand's saltier. No! I'm still gonna eat these though. Oh, okay. Here's the, the generic one. That's so good. I don't think I've ever used lotion in my entire life. It actually has structure. Is this too much? I don't know quantity wise. And I'm scared to put it on my body. So I'm looking to see how much it separates from itself. I feel like I could like rub this all the way up my arm. This is the generic brand and this is the um, name brand. B, for sure. I think this is an inferior product. Generic brand and your name brand. All right, I got it, I got it right. Lucky Super Soft. This is garbage. That one's awful, I'm not paying for that. My arm's like itchy now. I'm like thinking of like how much it's fizzling. I feel like option B has a higher syrup to carbonated water content. I'm testing how cold both of them are. Oh, I don't know if that's gonna help. I don't know if, it's probably not. Final answer, B is the Coke. Is B the Coke? All right, Coca-Cola. Ah. A has less frosting and it's not symmetrical. This one's less smooth. I know the Pop-Tarts aren't that smooth. First impression, this is not name brand based on the top of the Pop-Tart. That's, that's a big bite. It's like all over the place. Option B is 100% the real Pop-Tart. Pop-Tarts. All right, nailed it. Toast him, pop-ups? This is like, I'd rather have dry white bread than this. The moist drillings and bakery fresh taste. Uh, debatable. This one tasted better. Did it really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Whoever made this should be ashamed of themselves. But you like the pop-ups thoroughly, right? Obviously. What? So, when I was a kid, my parents would hire babysitters to watch us when they'd go out for the night alone or have something they were doing with their friends. Most of the time, they would be high school kids from church that they would hire. My, my favorite one, his hobby was magic. So we would always beg my parents to get him because he would bring magic tricks. It was the most entertaining babysitter of all time. But there was a consistency in the routine when we had these high school kids, no matter who babysat. When they'd get to our house, my parents would walk them through all the things they needed to know for the night, like whether or not we had eaten, what chores we had left to do, and of course, what bedtime was. They, they would give the sitter a list of instructions, and then after that, they turned to us, my brother and I, and they gave us one instruction. Right before my parents would walk out the door, they would say something to my brother and I, they would look at us, and they would say, be good, be good. I know my parents aren't the only ones who've said that to their kids when they're leaving for a few hours. And my brother and I, we knew what that meant. It meant don't break anything, no violence, don't hurt each other, and listen to the one or the ones that we have left in charge. It wasn't complicated. We knew what good meant. They didn't have to walk through a long list of rules. It was easy. Now, I don't mean to say that we were good all the time. That's neither here nor there. My point is be good was easy to understand. So much so that when I became a parent myself and, and my kids were young enough to have babysitters, I found myself saying the same thing as I would walk out the door. Be good. And, and not having to explain it to them. Be good, girls. 
don't break anything, don't hurt each other, and listen to the police officer, I mean, the babysitter that we left you with. And, and, and just like I did when I was a kid, my girls got it. I didn't have to explain all that each time. B be good. They, they knew, I knew what it meant. But can I share with you what I have found to be true? And my guess is this is something that you found as well. As we grow up, this thing that was very simple when we were kids, be good, it gets very complicated and gray. Because as we get older, like teens and adults, we have this capacity to self-justify everything we do as good. To convince ourselves that some not good choices are actually somehow decent. And what was once easy when we were kids is this crazy machine of a brain we have starts to do its magical work of rationalization. It starts to redefine good as whatever it is that feels, you know, right for us. And like you saw in that video earlier, where it's hard to tell the difference between two things, I wonder if it becomes hard for us sometimes to tell the difference between good and evil. All right, evil is not a word that I like to use a lot. It's very Disney-esque, the, the evil queen from Snow White. I'm afraid when I say evil, we all think of something that is just so extreme, and none of us are this. Most of us don't know anyone who is this. But I have used the word evil a little bit more this year. In fact, I used it with you back in August when I was casting vision for this thing we're doing out here at Crosswinds called Goodness Village. There's a verse in Romans 12:21. Um, it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The idea is if we treat each other with goodness, we can overcome so much of the evil that's in this world. But here's the problem. We're not kids anymore. Goodness seems to have gotten confusing. And, and how do we know which person's version of goodness is the correct one? I began prepping this message two Thursdays ago, January 7th, the day after thousands of people stormed the Capitol building looking to overturn the most recent presidential election. Actually, many of them looking to do far more than that. At least one who, who brought zip ties that he wanted to use as handcuffs, suggesting that he planned to take prisoners, right? Another person who parked his pickup truck down the block with 11 homemade pipe bombs, an assault rifle, and a handgun. And then reports of groups of people shouting and chanting that they wanted to grab the vice president who would not go along with what the president wanted him to do. People shouting to get him so they could bring him outside and lynch him. What a mess this was. And, and most of us sat and we watched this on TV and we, and we thought or we said that is not good. I, you know, I don't care who you voted for you probably recognize the people doing those things as a radical extreme and said, that's not good. That's the evil that needs to be overcome with good. But, but if you think about it, and, and this is a scary thought, the people who did that thought that they were the good ones overcoming evil. Did you see the Jesus signs? Jesus 2020 is if Jesus was in favor of what was happening on those Capitol steps where that, that flag was hung. Is if Jesus is on the same team as any politician. Um, people with crosses and, and, and Make America Godly Again t-shirts and, and hats. Is, is if this activity these rioters were engaged in is part of the path towards godliness. Somebody took the Christian flag into a congressional chamber and waved it around. You, you don't see these much anymore, but in the church that I grew up in, there was an American flag on one side of the stage and a Christian flag on the other. Somebody took one into a congressional chamber and waved it as if Jesus won the day. Meanwhile, five people died. One, a police officer who was overpowered and beaten, struck in the head with a fire extinguisher by people who thought that they were overcoming evil with good? I, I get that many people who went to the Capitol that day to protest, they never imagined this kind of violence breaking out. J just like I get that people who protested racial injustice this past summer didn't imagine it. 
But those who did imagine riots and look forward to it two Wednesdays ago, and those who did look forward to it over the summer, if when those people left the house that day, their parents could have said, be good, and they would have known that it meant don't break anything, don't hurt anyone, and listen to the people in authority. But again, this thing right here will convince you that you are the one doing good and overcoming evil while you do the not so good things you do. So what if there was a way to have goodness explained to us for it to be laid out exactly what it is where we don't allow our brains to rationalize, where we give it to them straight, explaining it in detail? There is the Bible. It explains goodness. And, and what I want to do today is just read you some words from the book of Romans and show you in a very straightforward message what goodness is and what it isn't. And, you know, this is not a message aimed at crazy radicals because that's not you. And it, it's not a message targeted more toward Democrats or Republicans, uh, Trump supporters, Biden supporters, independents. It's not toward people who wear masks or people who don't. Anti-vaxxers or, or, or people like me who cannot wait to get my shots. Because we, we are all of those at Crosswinds. We're a microcosm of America, or, or at least the Bay Area. We got a little bit of everything. And I am talking to everyone today who's got one of these, a brain that is clever enough to tell you you're being good when maybe you're not. And the reason we're doing this, because there can be no confusion among God's people. You must definitively know what good looks like so that it can actually overcome evil. And to be clear today, these are not the musings of Pastor Chris. These are from the Bible, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans. Actually, these are the things that he says right before he says to overcome evil with good. So if you're watching this at home, I want to ask you to do something. Pause it. Like, I really mean it. Pause it and go grab a Bible. Um, we will put the verses up on the screen, but... I think there's a power to you knowing that this is written in here. I didn't make it up. Um, so let's go old school. Follow along in an actual book or your phone or tablet if that's where your Bible is these days. Um, we are going to be in Romans 12. So you can open it in Romans 12. There's no shame in using the table of contents to find Romans if you need to. And as you're getting there to Romans 12, let me give you some context. Do you know what was happening to the Christians in Rome around about the time that Paul wrote them this letter in Romans? Nero. You heard that name? Nero had been the emperor for about two or three years. Uh, Nero, most famous for the story where Rome burns to the ground while Nero fiddles the day away. Now, history actually tells us that's wrong. The fiddle did not exist at the time of Nero. Um, Nero was 35 miles away when the great fire broke out. He, he actually let his palace be used as a shelter since thousands were left homeless from the fire. But Nero took the blame. And uh, there are a few reasons for that, but, but maybe the main one is that Nero didn't like Christians. For a while, he had seen their growing influence in Rome. And, and so after the fire, he arrested, tortured, and killed hundreds of Christians under the misinformation that he put out, fake news, that they were the runs, ones running around starting fires. Now, those events, Rome burning, and then the way Christians were treated following it, they happened eight years after this letter was written. But even at the time that Paul writes this, Romans, Christians are not exactly loved. And Paul is writing to a group of people who are nervous that there is real evil that someone wants to do to them. All right, the part I want you to see begins in verse 9, Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Okay, this is the intro to what he's about to say. Basically, Romans, I'm about to tell you what's good, the opposite of evil. Listen up. What is goodness? Here we go. Verse 10. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. All right, I, I want to stop as we go through this and, and make sure we understand what these words mean. And, and I want to give you five things that goodness is. And the first one comes out of this verse, love one another with mutual affection. Maybe your Bible says be devoted to one another in love. Um, if you think about it, this line is about a commitment to something that Jesus spoke of so significantly, the greatest commandment, to love one another as yourself. But then even more, 
to love your enemies. And Paul does something here in this verse we just read. He expands the idea of love to be showing someone else honor. Okay, first thing, if you want to be good, here's what it means. Love and honor. In other words, treat other people with admiration and respect. All right, I want to encourage you to grab a piece of paper or something that you keep these notes in. Write these five things down. The first thing, goodness, is to love and honor and and making sure we understand what that means. To love and honor, it is to treat other people with admiration and respect. Now, a few things come to mind as we talk about that. I, I have done a lot of weddings over the years, and the great thing about wedding vows, there are no rules. You can say whatever you want. All, all that matters is we sign the license at some point, we send it into the county. Because of that, a lot of people put their own stuff into their vows. They, they, they make their own, right? Like, um, I promise not to watch the next episode without you. Or, uh, I, I vow to get a professional, even though I really want to try to do it myself first. Or I promise to turn on the air conditioning when you're hot, even if I'm totally freezing. Lots of great original ideas out there for vows, but more often than not, people fall back to the traditional and and they often use those two words we've been saying in their vows, love and honor. Actually, it's love, honor, and obey, but more and more people are dropping the obey. Anyway, love and honor are words we think of in a marriage. So as you read this in verse 10, it's possible that you think, okay, well, what it means to be good is to love and honor someone that I'm married to, my, my family, maybe those that I'm friends with. Actually, this is not about that. Remember the context. This is written to Christians who are having evil done against them. And in their case, by the government, people of other religions who, who in coming years are going to want to see these Christians fight it out in the Colosseum in Rome. Love and honor is not just admiring and respecting those that you already care about. It's about doing that with those who would bring evil to you. Respect and admire those who would hurt you. Respect and admire even those who are against you. This is part of what it means to be good. Now, I don't know how you feel when you hear that. How do I admire someone that I don't feel admiration for? And if we're honest, This is not how most of us have been taught to operate, right? We we have a saying these days, maybe you've heard this, respect is earned, not given. The idea is I will show you respect once you prove yourself to be respect worthy. But Paul writes to honor one another, to outdo each other in showing honor. And what that means is I respect you because you are made in the image of God, not because you prove yourself to be respect worthy. Every human God creates is to be given respect. And then I admire you. Okay, that doesn't mean I approve of you. It just means I find something admirable about you or in you. Goodness calls us to respect and find something admirable in everyone, even when they are evil. How crazy is that? All right, let's keep going. Verse 11. Verse 11 says, Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. He says to have patience with others. He says to be praying for the people who you would think of as evil, who who are against you and what you stand for. Part of being good, showing patience, praying for your enemies. Now, look at verse 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. All right, at first glance, that seems like a verse about helping people out who are, are struggling financially. And it is that. It certainly is that. But, but there's a spirit underneath what he's saying that the words don't get at. Have any of you used Airbnb yet? I'm assuming at this point many of you have, although maybe not so much during COVID. Uh, a few years ago, I went down to Santa Cruz for a study break, just, just a couple of nights. And I found a place on Airbnb that was just a room in someone's home, a bedroom. But I chose it because it had a backyard with a little table where I could do some planning, I could do some prepping. And, you know, you can get a whole house or apartment to yourself on Airbnb, but you can also rent a room um, while the people who own it are home with you, which is what I did. And it was weird, absolutely as weird as that sounds, to sleep in the bedroom of some stranger's place, spending the night wondering if they are axe murderers and are going to chop through my very flimsily locked bedroom door. 
And, and as weird as it was for me, I imagine it was equally weird for them. Who did we let in our house? Some strange religious type guy who says he's a pastor and is studying all day? What's he really doing? But what made it slightly more comforting were reviews. I could read hundreds of reviews of people before me who had stayed there and survived. And, and people said nice things about this couple who owned the house, and I felt like I would probably be okay. And theoretically, they could read reviews about me. I don't think there were any at the time, but I have at least one good one now. Anyway, I felt pretty secure until the second night. Another guest arrived to stay in the bedroom across the hall from mine. Another stranger. And while they had read each other's reviews, I had not seen his. And it hit me, I am only as secure as their judgment on whether that stranger is safe and I know that they accepted me with no reviews. All right, well, I bring this up because this verse actually alludes to this ancient Airbnb kind of thing that they had. In their culture, hospitality meant offering free lodging to visitors, to strangers. And sometimes Jewish travelers would even carry letters of reference when they traveled to show other Jewish people that they were trustworthy to stay the night. They carried with them their reviews. All right, this practice is what Paul is talking about when he says contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. He's talking about this very thing. But can you imagine in a time of persecution where that gets sketchy? I mean, how do I know you're safe? How do I know that you're on like my side? Who am I welcoming into my house and my life? And, and the spirit of what Paul is getting at here in these lines is he's saying, give people the benefit of the doubt. Go back to giving others the benefit of the doubt. All right, we live in a time right now of great suspicion. One of the things that I've kind of heard people talk about is the danger of civil war breaking out. I actually heard somebody on the radio the other day say, we are in a civil war. We've been in one for years. It's more like a civil cold war, but we're in one. I don't know if that's true, but I do think that people are looking at other people and not giving them the benefit of the doubt, looking with suspicion, looking with cynicism, where, where every statement, every tweet, every action is picked apart, and then people make assumptions about what was meant by that said thing, and, and what this reflects, it reflects a cynicism, right? I presume that you, my neighbor, that, that, that I might disagree with, are evil, and that I am on the other side of you. And so when Paul reminds them of this Airbnb custom in, in, in the part of his letter on be good, he's trying to say, let's get back to a time when we believed the best about each other. When we didn't assume that everybody was out to get us or, or against us because they think differently. Where yes, we were cautious. People carry letters, their reviews, but we also gave them the benefit of the doubt. That is part of what it is to be good. All right, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Okay, I promise I'm not going to stop at every verse, but do you know what the ancient sages used to say before Jesus' teachings took hold? It was actually something really similar to this. They used to say, don't retaliate against those who curse you. It's kind of a turn the other cheek thing. Jesus was not the first to preach that retaliation was bad. But look at verse 14 in your Bible here. This is a whole nother level. It doesn't say, don't retaliate against those who curse you. It says, to bless them. Actually, bless them. Paul says, you have heard it said when someone curses you, don't retaliate. I tell you, bless them. Okay, you want to test what goodness looks like in our culture? Who is currently on the side of good right now? Look for the person who's saying good things about the person who's saying bad things about them. Let me see, who's doing that today? Oh, right, no one. The order of the day is, you curse me, especially publicly, I curse you. Okay, here's the third thing that being good is, according to this verse. Say good about those who say bad about you. You want to be good? You say a blessing when someone else says a curse. Say good about those who say bad about you. Okay, let's read the next verses. This is verse 15, and, and, and there's so much we could pull out of this. We just don't have time. It would take us hours and hours, but verse 15 Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, 
Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. I have so much to say about that line right there. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. We're going to save that for the next series. I think God has something important for us today and just that idea right there of humility. But verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. Okay. That is so good right there and it's so relevant. You want to be good, then do what is noble in the sight of everyone. Not just, not just what do I consider a, a good noble response to this thing that somebody did to me, but what would everyone agree is a noble response? Remember, your brain will convince you that what you're doing is noble. What you're saying, how you're responding to somebody you think has done evil of some sort, you will convince yourself that you are noble. Paul says, don't base it on your eyes only. Base it on other people's eyes. Oh, and not just those who already agree with your eyes, but everyone's eyes. Okay, you might hear that and say, that is impossible. Nobody can agree on what is noble these days. Well, that's not true. Some things are universally good. Um, if we think that it's impossible for something to be noble in everyone's eyes, we might as well give up right now. See, here's what the fourth part of being good looks like. Asking yourself, does it pass the everybody test? Now, here's what I mean by everybody test. Um, 10 out of 10 people would say it is noble to help an old lady cross the street. That passes the everybody test. You can be sure that that is good. 10 out of 10 people think it's right to stand up for a person who's being mistreated. That passes the everybody test. It's noble. It's a safe bet that that is good. 10 out of 10 people think telling the truth is a good thing. It passes the test. But if 4 out of 10 or 5 out of 10 think that ripping apart the Capitol building in D.C., or a federal building in Portland is good, it's not. Paul says, broaden your measure for what you think is noble. Not just what you and your like-minded friends think is good, but what is noble in the sight of all. Okay, verse 18. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Maybe you've heard this before, live peacefully with everyone. We think this means if somebody's angry with you, if you have a conflict, you go make it right. Okay, that's a good thing to do. That's not what this means. In Paul's time, he was instructing Christians who were living in Rome to try to get along with their neighbors. Living peaceably meant, hey, don't expect those who don't believe like you to value everything that you value. It meant you live in a diverse place, Rome. And if you try to force everyone to be like you, or you judge them for having different points of view, different ways of life, different beliefs, different values, you will start a war. So as it depends on you, even if someone else's values conflict with your own, you live at peace with them, which actually combines with verses 19 and 20. We're almost done here. Beloved, Never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Which does not sound good. So maybe I better explain that. What he's saying here is you don't get someone to admit they're wrong and change their ways by telling them they're wrong. Have you, have you noticed how that doesn't work? When was the last time a Democrat told a Republican that they were wrong and that person went, thank you for pointing that out. You are right. I'll change. When did a person on the far right tell a person on the far left that they had a bad idea or understanding of how the economy works? And that person said, good call. I'm coming around to your side. That's not, that's not how change happens. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And then, and then look at that line again, this problematic line. When you do this, you heap coals, burning coals on their heads. Now, again, that does not sound good. That sounds like the opposite of good. That, that actually sounds like vengeance. This is actually a reference to an ancient Egyptian ritual where a guilty person is a sign of repentance. When they realized they were guilty, they would carry a basin of glowing coals on their head. Like, 
like they would decide they're guilty and, and as a show of repentance, they, they wanted to repent, they would do this. They'd put this basin of coals up there. So what Paul is saying here is when you are kind to your enemy, when you feed them and you give them something to drink, you may cause them to change. If you really want to change someone's mind, here's what you do. Become their friend. So here's the fifth part of being good. Turn your enemies into friends. Okay, notice what it's not. It's not change your enemies' minds. Convince people to agree with you. Good is turn them into friends, and in so doing, they may change themselves. Now, here is how this section closes. The line I told you at the beginning, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil. This is how you overcome evil with good. I know as we've grown up, good has gotten confusing. Who's on the side of good? Who's on the side of evil? And Paul just makes it real clear. No one. There's not a good side and an evil side. But there are a lot of people created in the image of God, created to be good, who do evil things. And the way that you overcome that is by being good yourself. Crosswinds. Look at your list, the one that we just put together as we read through this passage. Treat other people with admiration and respect. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't assume the worst about them. Say good about those who say bad about you. Ask, does this thing I want to go do right now or say right now pass the everybody test where everybody would agree it's noble? Turn your enemies into your friends. If we could get the United States to do these things, how good would our country be, our world be? But fat chance, that's not going to happen. We've all been around long enough to know our country cannot do these things. You cannot force people to be good. But what if you did this and I did this? What if the people of God, empowered with the Holy Spirit in them, decided to live this way? Paul's words are not meant to be a prescription for a utopia where everybody's always going to be good. He does not say, here's how you should live and everything will be perfect. He says, there is evil in the world. There will be evil. But Jesus has overcome the world. And you can too, through your goodness. And what if we, God's people, could start a tidal wave of good that overcomes evil? I love that this tiny house community for our unhoused neighbors, this thing we're in the middle of construction on right now out here at Crosswinds, I love that it's called Goodness Village because an evil has been done to people. That, that's not meant to say it was done by someone or some system. I just mean that evil happens and someone living homeless, that's just wrong. It's bad. It's evil. And, and I love the name Goodness for this village. And I love it because whether you know it or not, what we're doing, what you're doing, what we're leading our community here in doing, the people of Dublin, Livermore, Pleasanton, San Ramon, Danville, Hayward, anywhere anyone who gets involved in this is doing, at least right here, what we will all be doing is a goodness that overcomes evil. And goodness can be a part of your story. It already is because it's part of the story of your church. But let's not stop there. Our country has seen an evil couple of weeks. Some of you might say an evil couple of years, an evil couple of decades. Some of you can make a a pretty good argument. It's been an evil couple of centuries. But every step along the way, that evil could have been, often was, and can be overcome by God's people committing to hold fast to what is good.
worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you.
we love you. We are so thankful for you. We believe in who you are and all the attributes of who you are. We, we are so thankful. And we ask your Holy Spirit to come and to be with us today, throughout the week. Thank you that we get to worship you as a body of believers. We love you. Amen.